All right. Boy, we haven't had uh, technical. We used to have technical difficulties all the time. It was like a, a guaranteed thing when we were first learning how to do this in the early days of COVID. Um, but now we're, uh, we're we haven't had that in a while. So uh, apologies for that. But we'll we'll um, you know we'll we'll go maybe three minutes after just to make up for it. Uh, so today, uh, so it's a Wednesday. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Wednesday uh, for a change. We're um, going to talk to two writers uh, who both of whom are they, they, they have a lot of a lot in common, a lot of differences. Both are used to writing for adult readers and they've written children's picture books and they're both out mid November this week and last uh, this last week. We got Lola and the Troll written by Connie Schultz, who is a uh, better known as a Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper columnist and this week. We have uh, just yesterday, uh, My Thoughts Have Wings by Maggie Smith. Maggie is a poet and brought us the uh, what's been termed a, a viral poem, Good Bones, in 2016. Uh, they both have several books to their names, and this is their first foray into picture books. And so we're interested to know um, what it's like to um, start with a new um, writing for a new form. So. Uh, welcome, uh, Connie. You're up in up in Cleveland, Ohio, right? I am. Nice to have you here. And Maggie is uh, actually in my town here in the site of the studios. I, I guess we didn't really think that I, you could just come over and we could like do this side by side. But but Maggie's in Bexley. Nice to see you, Maggie. Good to see you too. All right. So um, so. As we, as we go along, if you have questions, uh, as you, as Heather says, ask them in the room and we'll, we'll get to them. We'll get you to come on camera and ask your questions directly. Um, I'm sure there are uh, a lot of questions for, for Connie and Maggie. And, uh, and we're going to just sort of uh, have a conversation. As I told Connie and Maggie, feel free to jump in, interrupt each other, ask each other questions. Um, you don't need to hear too much of me so um, we can... Uh, we'll just make it casual and fun and unscripted. But let me start. I will start with a question, and that is, and I, I'm going to start. I'll, I'll start with Maggie um, because Connie, I, I, I know the origin story of how this came about, which is a fun uh, and interesting story. But I don't know Maggie's origin story, so I'm curious to hear that. What um, you've, you've written? You've written for adults. You've written memoir. You've written poetry. Uh, and now you wrote something to appeal to children. So where did that come from? Uh, it came from being a mom. <laughs> I uh -huh. think this is, um, I spend a lot more time parenting than I do writing. So it, it actually seems um, sensible maybe that I would come around to writing something um, directly lifted. Um, as they say in something like um, Law and Order Ripped from the Headlines, this is a <laughs> ripped from the bedtimes. I just made that up. You see how I'm yeah. still so sharp at 4 <laughs> That's good. You're um, writing as we speak. <laughs> um, it really came about from bedtime conversations with my kids, um, particularly around um, peak lockdown, um, COVID lockdown a couple of years ago when um, school shut down. And I had, I think Rhett was in first grade. So having a first grader, it's very confusing. Um, there was a lot going on in our house personally at the time too, added on top of um, sort of the fear of the pandemic and not knowing when life would get back to quote unquote normal. And and so I just remember him saying um, during some pretty difficult tuck-ins, you know, I'm trying to calm down. I'm trying to think good thoughts, but the bad thoughts keep pushing them out of the way. Mm. And it was so relatable because I too am a bedtime ruminator. I think a lot of us are busy during the day. And so we're emailing, we're teaching, we're writing, we're talking, we're running errands and we're able to kind of push some of those anxieties and worries to the margins because we're full of other things. And then as soon as, you know, your head hits the pillow, it's like whoosh, everything kind of floods in, in that quiet, still time. And so we came up with a, a little ritual to fill up with 
either things to look forward to or or memories that were positive and and it helped him and it just occurred to me maybe I shouldn't hoard this um <laughs> as a bedtime ritual in my own home maybe there's something to this that I could write um that could be like a little conversation starter for other families that are having this happen too and so that's that's how it started I, I will say it is it's very relatable as an adult, as you say, I mean, the, the whole idea of you go to bed and then suddenly there's all this stuff going on in your head. And this is sort of a, uh, I, I suppose this would be good for any of us to read before before we go to bed, just to settle down. Um, so Connie's story is a little bit, uh, is well, Connie, you, you, I think you told this when you spoke uh, at, uh, at the ACES conference here in Columbus. Uh, um, Connie was our keynoter for our, uh, our after dinner speaker and this is an amazing job. Everybody felt like eight feet tall, so proud to be copy editors after, after that uh, address by Connie. But you did hint, you did tell us a little bit about the origin for, um, for Lola and the Troll. I, I will tell you that I, I also just wanted to say this about Maggie. She had a best-selling memoir last year, you could make this mm -hmm. place beautiful. And so while it's wonderful about her viral poem, I really want everyone to know that's out there if you haven't read it yet. I, as you know, Maggie, I loved your memoir too. So my story, I wish I had just the warm maternal instinct that Maggie had, but mine was basically <laughs> having dealt with trolls for 20 years on the internet. And um, I mean, I'm a grandmother of eight, so I guess there's that, but really that is, <laughs> my daughter keeps saying now, this is this is so great you did this and you had these, it makes me feel so much better because my motive was so different initially. Um, mm. I, I'm on Facebook all the time and my Facebook page is public and I'm constantly moderating conversations, constantly blocking trolls. I call it blockity block block, you know, and, and then I have to announce to people sometimes because they target women. And, and one day in 21, I just said, Tom, the troll has been blocked. And somebody on the thread said that would make a funny children's book. So I moved over to Twitter when I was still doing much of Twitter. I don't, I'm not over there as much now. And I simply tweeted that I'm going to write a, I think I'll write a children's book and call it Tom the Troll's Been Blocked. And my agent, Gail Ross, called me about an hour later and she said, why are you writing a children's book when you're supposed <laughs> to finish your next novel? And I said, I I'm not writing a children's book. And she said, you are now uh, Casey McIntyre of Razorbill, which is an imprint of uh, Penguin Random House reached out to my agent within, I think, an hour. Well, it must have been because Gail was on the phone with me yelling at me pretty soon after and uh, said, we want Connie's children's book. I did not in any way think I was capable of doing that because I have such reverence for children, really good children's picture books. I collect them. I love them. I've been reading to my children and now my grandchildren. But Casey McIntyre, um, who unfortunately died at age 38 last fall, uh, she... She, oops, I'm sorry, my phone's talking to me. I apologize. Um, she, <laughs> sorry about that. I thought I turned everything off. She um, convinced me that I could write this book and she was with me every step of the way. And we decided that the way a little, I decided pretty quickly it was going to be a little girl. I wanted a strong female character uh, because I still find them, you know, they're not as common in children's books, much better than when my daughter was little. And uh, I wanted to call her Lola. And then I had to figure out how do you, how do you troll a little girl and make it, so that the adults, especially women, understand what's happening, but children get it. And so the troll holds up signs insulting her. And with every insult, she tries to change something else about herself um, until she cannot recognize herself anymore. Fortunately, a bookseller, her favorite adult outside of her grandparents and parents, and yes, I did have to slide in the grandparents reference, um, Miss Neesby recognizes what's happening and helps Lola see she's wonderful just the way she is which helps Lola embrace who she is. And she has the courage and the kindness to take on the troll. And, and you're, um, you mentioned the, the editor for the book and it was just a, uh, I just wanted just a little editorial comment here. The, the, I read the, the essay you did on Substack about how the, the, how it came about and um, working with your editor. And it's just so, um, it's just so nicely written that you, you start out doing what we would expect and to say, I wrote a children's book and here's, here it is. And here's how it came about. 
And but here's the rest of the story. It is a little bit kind of the here's the rest of the story. And you talk about the editor. And it's just such a lovely tribute to that person and and how she was part of that book. She she died of uh, ovarian cancer, I think, uh, um, right. during the during the process. Um, Thank you for saying that. Anybody who's been writing in this group will probably understand this, I hope. You know, Random House wanted me to get moving on promoting the book. I felt I was really up against a wall until I could figure out how to pay tribute to Casey. Mm. And it, it took a while because I, I was so worried about looking like I was trafficking in this tragedy, right? I, I And then I finally understood something pretty central to our relationship, Casey's in mind. And she would be saying to me, we need you to sell the book. We need you to talk about the book. <laughs> and it, it kind of got me there. It is not at all unusual for me, of course, to pay tribute to an editor. It's one of the reasons you had me speaking last year at the dinner. And I see my former creators editor, David Yance, is here, whom I, um, I just feel such a loyalty to and who worked so hard to improve Stubborn Me. Um, but thank you for pointing that out about Casey. And she, some of you may remember her as the editor. Once she died, she raised millions millions of dollars in her debt. This was her last wish to retire the medical debts of people who couldn't afford them. That's who Casey was. Um, so let me, let me ask about the, the, the process a little bit. It's, uh, it's a collaborative thing. You're both used to, you know, obviously writing in your own voice, um, your own opinions. Um, what is it like, collaborating with on a picture book with a with a uh, an artist i deliberately yeah. didn't ask anybody i figured i just let somebody jump in and yeah, oh maggie it, okay i'll go <laughs> um in my case i still have not met the illustrator of my book so it's an incredibly strange thing to have a collaborated with someone from afar and that on such an intimate story i mean this person was illustrating my son's actual fears, worries, and happy memories. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I gave very little direction. There's not a lot of text in a picture book. And so when I got the, the sketches back, you know, first they were pencil sketches, and then I would see like the full color art. It was just sort of mind boggling because my artistic ability is stick people. Um, like I just, I really, like I, I don't think I could draw two eyes and a nose. So to have Leanne Hatch, who is this, you know, award-winning writer and illustrator in her own right, agree to do this was mind boggling to me. I mean, I jumped up and down when, when she agreed to illustrate it. And then to open these PDFs every time she sent a new draft. And I would sit in this chair with my son in my lap and we would page through the PDFs. And I remember once he just, it hit him about three spreads in, oh, there we are. He doesn't quite look like that, but you get it. My dog doesn't quite <laughs> get look like that, but you get it. And he turned around and sort of made eye contact with me at one point, looking through the early drafts of this and said, it's me. Mm. And I said, yeah, it's us. Like this is, so he's been calling it our book, which is, really wild, but she she did things with the artwork that, I mean, just these little details, this cork board, you know, she has no idea that he actually has a magnet board in his bedroom where we keep photos and little mementos magneted on them. She doesn't know that. And yet she somehow captured that. Um, there were so many things she didn't know. And yet um, I feel like I telepathically <laughs> We shared things with her telepathically. It's just amazing to me what she was able to do. I I uh, I, I I thought I was so clever in sharing that, but now I can't seem to get back to <laughs> <laughs> can't seem to figure out how to close it. Where did it go? Zoom. Oh dear me! Well, this gonna, comes this, from uh, this is beautiful. Yeah. Um, I loved it uh, because she, I don't, I like, she, I, it's not cartoony at all. Oh, like she made it look so textured and rich. And a lot of this book takes place in the dark and she was able to use shading on these pages um, in such, and light and shadow in such an interesting way. Like I just, 
I'm in awe. I keep telling her, you made so much magic. I, I, you know, my words are like a third of the magic of the book and, and her art is easily two thirds. And that's, that's giving me like a, probably too much credit. I mean, she just did a wonderful <laughs> job. I'm, I'm sure there's a little bit of uh, excessive humility there. The words are beautiful also, but yeah, the, the drawings, <laughs> the drawings are terrific. Um, I, so I have, so I was able to share, I, I have some images. Uh, I can also share of uh, Lola and the troll. Um, and you'll forgive me if I'm a little slow. That was a PDF and I tried to turn the page, but I think once you share the page, it's stuck. You can only share that one page. So, uh, but this is, uh, that's Lola and tank. Oh my and gosh. This little dog. That little dog, uh, is modeled after our rescue dog, Walter. Yeah. He's 10 pounds and we always joke Walter's everything we never wanted in a dog and we love him desperately. He's happy and neurotic and very high energy, but he was the perfect companion for Lola. I knew I wanted him in every pay on, on every page because he was comic relief, even when it was getting really serious. Mm. And also children, I mean, I've been laughing at some of the emails from parents. Thanks a lot. Now my daughter wants a dog, not any dog. She wants tank. My son, <laughs> so funny. Um, Lola, the way we did it, um, I'm the same with as Maggie. I have never met Sandy Rodriguez in person, and she lives in London. She's from born in Mexico, lives in London, has two little girls. Random House asked me who I wanted. I had some thoughts about what kind of illustrator I wanted. And they gave me, I think, twelve to look at to pick from. And as soon as I saw Sandy's work, that was it. I wanted Sandy, and. Um, I was, you know, it's one of those and you wait to see if she's going to say yes. I'm sure, Maggie, you, you know, that period of time. And then the same, we're waiting for the sketches. Lola is, um, the model for Lola, Casey said, if you could give us an idea of what you want us to look like. And unlike Maggie, it sounds like they wanted art direction for me on almost every page. Um, mm. So I knew what Lola would look like. She would look like our granddaughter, Ella, who is now six. Um who uh, absolutely, the first time she saw the sketches and colors, she says, Grandma, I think Lola looks like me. And uh, I said, yes, she does. And then I've spent a lot of time explaining to the seven other grandchildren that, you know, <laughs> because this one lives in Rhode Island and she's far away. Um, so I, and Sandy was following me on Instagram. So I could tell when she, she always clicks on any picture of Ella or any picture of Walter. So it was like she was doing homework the entire time. And um, um but for the troll, I had to, I, Casey and I talked about it and I said, you know, I have no idea what this troll should look like. I want to see what Sandy comes up with. She was brilliant. She also came up with the sign, Lola loves farts. So of course that's on the back page of the book <laughs> cover because kids crack up. I love asking kids, how many of you like farts? Most, none of the girls, <laughs> eight boys at once in one class, raise their hands. Uh, but she also came up with the idea. I don't think I have it on the set I sent you, but she's got a charity box where Lola keeps throwing into it, 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 things that she no longer wants. that And it's all stuff that the troll has made fun of. And boy, does that resonate with the kids when I read it, because they they can see what's happening. They are, Maggie, I don't know how you're feeling, because you, your book just came out. Mine's been out for a little more than a week now. I told Sharon, I don't know why I would ever write for adults again after spending so much time <laughs> with children, because they are so into stories. They And and we are celebrities, not because of anything else we've ever done, but because we wrote a children's book. It's yeah. been so wonderful to be in their company and they'll tell you anything and they'll just respond in the moment. So it's been exhilarating. That gives me something to look forward to. I love that. <laughs> oh, and they're drawing pictures for me, writing little notes, and I've been collecting those. It's just quite moving. It you it real and bullying is such a with Lola stories about bullying. And their teachers keep re reaching out to me and some parents, but especially educators, how much this is a growing issue in schools and how happy they are that we're having this conversation. You know, you never know what's going to land and what's going to work. Mm -hmm. And they, um, it's, it's just, wow. It's just, I mean, I, obviously I'm going to write for adults again, but I have to tell you, I'm really enjoying the <laughs> I, I, Are you going to write for children again? Do you think, do you have another children's book in mind? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, no, no clues at this point. No, um, 
Well, that, that and, and you 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 touched on my next question. What it's like? I mean, you you've you've written a novel. You've written um, it, you've written uh, essay forms. You've had three books now. Um, all adult audiences, and now you're going in, and the kids are, you know, knee high and um, looking up to you. What what uh, how how is that different? And how much uh, how much of that have you done? And how much are you doing? Well, I'm doing a lot. I've been in, I mean, I went to one elementary school where I did six different readings, one per grade. It, oh, um, wow. I, I'm, I'm learning a whole new type of fatigue at the end of these because, you know, you do, the voice, <laughs> you do the energy and all, and I, I love all that. But um, what has also struck me, especially at bookstore readings and in libraries, the adults, there are so many adults present too, particularly women who come up, some of them quite emotional, saying how they feel it's so deeply this issue of being bullied and being attacked for who you are. And many have stories of having been bullied when they were younger. So, you know, you, I, and I can't speak for Maggie. I don't, Maggie, I'm wondering how you, when you put this out into the world, did you have some sense of who might respond? And are you being surprised by some of the people who are responding to it? Yeah. I mean, it just, it's, it's only been out for 24 hours. So I haven't actually, I haven't been in a space with it yet um i will have a launch at the public library in my neighborhood in a couple of weeks yes that's where i was uh yeah it, that's right it's a fantastic place i can't I'm, wait for you to do it yeah i'm really excited about that i mean i i think the one of the differences for me is because my last book was a memoir and a kind of a difficult memoir it was the first book that i could not have my children at events um, hmm. and so, and like when I've gone and done poetry readings or anything, they've been able to be there. They may not always love it. They may, you know, I've had definitely had a three-year-old sitting in the front row of a bookstore, uh, reading, holding a matchbox card, looking at the hardwood floor longingly, like just really wishing he could get down there instead of listening to mom read poems. <laughs> um, but the last book, they weren't able to come to anything. So all of the travel and speaking I did was a part from them. And so this is the first time in a long time that they'll get to come and like hear me read the book and also know the sort of story behind it. Um, and so um, I don't know how it will touch other people. I'm sort of yet to see like what happens with that, but it's exciting to me personally to get to share this with them in particular. And like my nephews will be there like that, that I think will be nice. And frankly, it's a lot less stressful to do the kind of travel and press for a book that is a bedtime story for children than a memoir about your midlife <laughs> life <laughs> shift. <laughs> I've, I've had that crossover somewhat because people still want to talk about my husband's Senate race. Right. So I can't we're like, we're the, not um, here for that. Right, but, no. But, but we but did. Support. I do. I do know what you mean about family being present. Five of our grandchildren were at my Bexley Public Library reading. And oh, and I didn't know they were coming. It was a surprise. Sherrod had planned it with the kids. And I when it was, I was very nervous. I I sound pretty different from you. I I'm pretty comfortable in adult with adult audiences. I walk out and I see a lot of kids. I also see a lot of adults. And I said, first words out of my mouth, y'all know this is a children's book, right? And everybody started <laughs> Because I, I, I was surprised by how many adults would want to attend, even if they didn't bring children. But of course, they're buying them for children also. Or they're buying them for adult friends and they want them to have it. But when it was over, we were walking through a, a, a maze behind inside the library to get to a different level to sign books. And our nine-year-old granddaughter, Jackie, was right next to me. Um, and she, I said, oh, I'm so glad that's over. I was so nervous. And she said, Grandma, why would you be nervous? You can do anything. <laughs> and that is the most prized memory of that yeah. day to have your grandchild say something like that. So you see how this becomes a family thing. I hope all of you are listening and certainly you, Mark, that it is different when we're writing and we have children in our lives because all mm. of a sudden we're a big deal because we wrote a book for them. Mm. Yeah, that's neat. And, I, you know, and I said the I, I mentioned that um, my thoughts of wings is, is very relatable um, I, I, used, I, I was somebody who used to always just like, I would go to bed, I would fall fast asleep and my wife would get really irritated at my ability to do that. I'm, I become a little bit more that sometimes or I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I'll be, and I'll start thinking about a hundred different things. 
so it's very relatable um you know uh, th those those thoughts flying around in your head but lola and the troll yes it's about bullying but i mean really it comes from uh our, our social media environment doesn't it i mean that's what inspired it oh well, i'm oh. not going to deny yeah. But I'm yeah. also a ruminator. I love Maggie's book because <laughs> I recognize myself. I recognize two of our grandchildren. And I'm, I'm the, I've always said I am a worst case scenario person. I, I could, if, I, if there was a way to make a living as that, I, I'd be really rich because I can always come up with, I just worry. Yeah. Right? <laughs> we should go into business. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I just love the book for the message that I, I get. I think that will resonate with so many adults, not just children, which is the perfect children's book in my view. Mm -hmm. Somebody, uh, somebody mentioned in the chat, and uh, we haven't talked about this, but uh, I guess it it makes sense. I, did, I didn't. I meant to ask you. Do you think we should read a little bit of the books? And I don't know how you even read, you know, a couple of pages, or it's you know, it's not that long. What, what do you think? Should we can we do a little bit of reading of the two books? I think that'd be a little hard with Lola, but maybe Maggie's got some thoughts on hers. I mean, Lola's kind of a there's a chronology. It's a to, process, isn't there? To Lola and what's happening to her. Um, yeah. I appreciate being asked that, but I think I'm, I'm not sure where I would go with that. Yeah, Mine is that makes with, sense. Uh, everybody worries. Here are some bad thoughts. Here are some good thoughts. <laughs> that's not, that's not that's really the, true. That's the Cliff Notes version. You know, <laughs> I, I try not to do that. If someone asks me what a poem is about, I cannot tell you and I will not give you any kind of elevator pitch or Cliff's Notes version of a memoir mm. or a book of poems. But with this mm -hmm. book, it's fairly easy. Everybody worries. Here are some bad thoughts. Here are some good thoughts. Now I feel a little bit better. I, I guess the one thing I'd say that I tried to do in this book is, is um, not shove the bad thoughts out of the way. You mm. know, it's one of the things that I think um, I've learned both from being a parent and being um, a worst case scenario thinker like Connie is that um, I don't think anybody is ever calmed down by being told calm down. Um, I don't think anyone ever stops crying by being told don't cry. No. Um, I don't think anybody stops worrying by being told don't worry. Like none of that actually does anything. Right. And it feels a little disingenuous when kids have real concerns and worries, whether it's a bully at school or someone who's picking on them or having issues with self-esteem or trying to figure out who they are or having issues with the pandemic or a divorce or, you know, losing a grandparent or whatever the thing is. It's disingenuous if a child says it's raining and we see the rain and we say, no, it's sunny. What are you talking about? Um, like validating their feelings and saying like, yes, those things are all happening. And there are all these other great things about you and about your life and about the world. So how do we not discount all the bad stuff, but like just kind of reframe and like pivot and turn our attention to some of the things that are going right, which as a worst case scenario thinker is hard for me sometimes as an adult too, because the the negative voice tends to be really loud and the positive voice can sometimes whisper <laughs> and it's our job as, as parents and, and probably as, as authors of children's books to like, make sure the good voice gets a say. That's Maggie, yeah. what Maggie listening to you, I'm realizing another thing we have in common is we were pushing up against really pushing back on traditional practice mm -hmm. and Lola, it was in, Casey and I talked about this a lot. It was very important to me that this girl not simply forgive him when she realizes he's new to the neighborhood. She's He's got to be held accountable. And she tells him, you have a lot of people to apologize to because he's been bullying a lot of people. And I just thought that was so important a message because having been a girl and then a woman always expected, you know, to be understanding, make excuses for people. Mm. Uh, it, that, and that's only gotten more the case. The more, the more, the bigger your own career gets, the more you're expected always to move past these things quickly and just ignore it. But I didn't want that to be the message for a child. If somebody has been bad to you, they should be apologizing and they should behave better. I love that. I love that. It is important because I do think sometimes, I mean, I have, 
I have an 11 year old and he is a very good hearted and sensitive child. And it is sometimes hard. Um, he will say, mom, don't go ham, but this happened at school. Yeah. And I'll say, I'm not going to go ham, but I don't believe in necessarily making nice when that's not called for or quickly forgiving when that's not called for or ignoring it, which I think as girls, we are often taught when we're young, like, oh, just ignore it and they'll leave you alone and go away. Um, or maybe they're just, they like you. And that's why they're pulling your hair yeah, on you. Right. You need to give them more positive attention. No, no, no. Let's just call this what it is and nip it in the bud. So I love that. Well, and not to give away the ending, but I love it. I love that the 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 troll asks, "Why aren't you bullying me back, Lola?" And uh, her response is, "I want to be braver than that, buddy, and I'll bet you do too." Yeah. He uh, also. I I love that Sandy and I agreed that he should be shorter than Lola once he gets down off his perch, this big old bully. <laughs> and she informs him, he, he's so surprised to see she's tall. And she said, I'm tall on the inside. That's where it counts. Mm -hmm. So um, so we definitely have a uh, young woman's empowerment. Um, it, I, I'm curious, Maggie, the, the you, you said that the, your son inspired this, but you wanted it to be a girl. What was, why was that? I actually didn't, um, I didn't say, Oh, I didn't say at all. And actually the, um, I don't think there's anywhere in the text. I could be wrong. I don't think there's anything in the text that would indicate gender. Yeah, you're right. It's just a parent and child. So, um, the only, the only thing that we know is that it's a mother and child. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say anything. I just sent the manuscript and um, and what, um, what she drew is, is a girl. And yet Rhett still turned around when he looked at those pencil sketches and said, it's me, which I love. Yeah. He never yeah. said, why is it a girl? Um, which you might think, well, some boy wouldn't want their experience drawn in a girl way. I actually love that. Cause I think as a, you know, growing up a girl, I had to read myself into so many boys stories, you know, yeah. like so many right. of the books I loved as a kid were really the, the protagonist was a boy having an adventure and mm -hmm. I would have to see myself in that child. So I actually kind of love that he is able and has to be able to see himself as this other person via the illustrations. I felt so strongly to have a girl in part, my daughter's 36 and when she was growing up, there were so few children's books with strong female characters. I can still name them. Yeah. Amazing Grace, Brave yeah. Byron, The Paper Bag Princess. And, and you made me think, Maggie, for myself, certainly, and I'm far older than you. I'm 66. The book that changed my life was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Oh. Because not only was it the girl, I mean, character, but she was poor and I was working class. And it was it had such an impact on me. Uh, still, I can't talk about it without thinking about the impact, you know, and I can imagine, I can remember where I was the first time I started reading it, swinging on the front porch in the hot summer, well, in our house on Route 20, in Ashtabula, and you know how you drag your one foot so you could keep it going, and, and just reading and reading until my mother would say, you're going to ruin your eyes, it's dark, you got to get in here. It was so, um, it had such a profound impact. So it's not that I don't want boys, I mean, plenty of boys have been talking about how They've been bullied, and I love that they're having the conversations. I also love that boys can be inspired by a brave girl. Let's start that mm -hmm. messaging early, right? It's to me, it was not so much. Well, it was everything. I wanted it to be a girl, but it had nothing to do with how I feel about boys. I just wanted, I wanted this strong character, and there are certainly more books out there now with strong female characters. But Casey was all in when we were talking about how it was going to be a girl. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I'm glad you said that because I, I I remember my daughter reading. My daughter was a voracious reader, and all the classic stories she read, there were it was a female, it was a the default male uh, character. No matter who, no matter what hero it was, it was always uh, a, a male um, lead character. And we see that a lot more nowadays. That there are more 
more books with with uh, female leads. You know, you're seeing that in Disney movies now, of course. Um, but it is it, it's interesting that you know I'm glad you said that because to not have a female lead character sort of um, you you don't the, the people who who maybe are told that they don't need to stand up or they shouldn't stand up to the bullies um, are probably the people who need to see that it's okay to to stand up and be proud of yourself and reach out and at the same time and and say look you're not you're not trying to be a bully here this you're better than this and um, and let's uh, let's work I this out I don't think I don't think that works on Twitter by the way <laughs> <laughs> well no. yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're just, you're just needy. You're just, you just, you're lonely. I know. I block, mm. block, block, block. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, maybe we should try that. I, 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 you, I, I'm not on, I'm not, I'm not on Twitter. Um, it's, always, it's always been a whole different experience for me. When I was on Twitter, I was dealing only with people I selected and wanted to, to deal with. And if some people would uh, work their way in. I could just as easily ignore them. I didn't have to block them. But uh, um, as as a woman in journalism, uh, uh, with a syndicated column, um, a husband who's in politics, and uh, I think he's a Democrat. I, I oh, remember. that explains. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that explains so much of the hate mail. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I had a colleague, a former colleague, wrote to me yesterday and said, "You're not fooling anybody." He is a dear friend. He said. This is totally about working in a newsroom. <laughs> the the your, your book. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> we're about working in the newsroom. I see. Yeah, I, I guess so. Um, well, I definitely saw the. I definitely saw the, uh, the 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 social media aspect of it. Where where are you doing? You're on Substack, um, writing regular columns, which are wonderful. Um, yeah, Maggie's on Substack too. Is she? I didn't. I haven't seen Maggie on Substack. Okay, I'll have to look. Okay, and uh, and I've been following you. I think I maybe told you this before. I, I've been following your Instagram and the Instagram. If you know, follow one person on Instagram. Follow Connie Schultz. I don't think I follow I, I, Maggie. Are you on Instagram? I don't. Yes, I am on Instagram. All right. Oh, I apologize. So, yep. Yeah. Okay. Well, Connie's are um, puppies, um, grandkids. Um, weather shots which relates because we're both in ohio and um and then her husband um um often with puppies and grandkids so um <laughs> yeah i'm pretty much just, all about that stuff on instagram it's so much fun right it's just it's calmer and it's um and my subtext called hopefully yours for a reason i'm i've really pivoted from much of the political writing because i just felt like it's you know, there's so many voices out there doing the same thing. And Sherrod was running, is running for re-election. So I, I, I left USA Today when my editor left. I wanted to pivot. Mm -hmm. and I feel like it's, I'm merging all my lives over at mm -hmm. Substance. So I can pick what I'm going to write about. And I'm really having a lot of, I'm a little surprised. And Maggie, I wonder about you as well. I'm a little surprised at how many people are willing to subscribe, uh, pay or not pay, but especially paid. I've been really surprised by that which has made me very angry at news organizations who used me so much to get subscribers. <laughs> now I know why. Um, the support of people who will support writers. I mean, I, all of my content is free. I'm not critical of anyone who charges for it. I just wanted to do it that way because I was so tired of being behind a paywall. And I can't get over how many people will pay, even if they don't have to, because they want to support the writing. That has moved mm -hmm. me beyond... I mean, Sharon hears me talk about it all the time. I still just can't quite get over it. And I'm so grateful for that because it's made it easier for me to say no to other stuff and just focus on the writing there. Yeah, I agree. And it's also, I mean, I really started mine because my origin story for my Substack stack is um, also Twitter, <laughs> which is that it sort of it started imploding and became a really difficult place to yeah. be. Um, and I thought I've, I've had this sort of writing community that I've built over years in this space. And it just made me realize how flimsy and kind of catch as catch can social media is. You're at the mercy of the algorithm. You have no idea who's seeing anything. You know, you feel like you're shouting about your picture book or whatever the thing is every day. Like you just feel like an infomercial, which sometimes feels terrible. 
but you'll <sighs> still meet someone who will be like, you have a book out. Yeah. And you realize that not everything that you're shouting into the void is reaching the human beings that you hope that it will reach. And so I started it in order to have a kind of like closer knit community of people and knowing like, oh, you're going to get this in an email. I don't have to count on you scrolling and maybe catching it. And that has made it um, a thousand times more enjoyable, like to know that it's being received. And the community we're building there. That's right. Uh, people are, and people will comment on sometimes yeah. just how grateful they are for the community we're building there. It feels similar in some ways to what I was trying to do on Facebook and I'm still very active there. But I agree with you, Maggie, the, you, you are, you're a prisoner to the algorithm. You frequently people say, why am I no longer seeing you? I don't know. What have you also been looking at, right? Mm -hmm. I, they feel over on Substack, you're, you feel some semblance of control. And so far the communication from people has been so meaningful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I get an occasional idea as well, but um, I agree, you know, I hadn't thought about it until the way you said it, it is a place where all the different writings we're doing in all these different places, we can collect it in one place because we can always link to other writing we like. I like lifting up writers. I haven't done as much of that on Substack that I'm going to. I've done it on Twitter and Facebook for years. I want you to see this piece and I want you to see that piece. That's always my advice to writers who are trying to get more of a following on social media. It can't just be about you and your yeah. work. The more you lift up good work of others, the more you get known as that person who supports writers and writers will support you. It's also just the right thing to do, right? There, it's it's not a zero sum game. If Maggie gets a bestseller, if Maggie gets a lot of headlines, that doesn't diminish the work I'm doing at all for me to also lift her up and say, look at this, this is great because that's the community we should be for one another always. We all get our moments. And I mm -hmm. certainly have had my share of moments in the sun and they're quite memorable. But the very next day, I still got to figure out what I'm going to write next. And I think it's important to keep that perspective. I love that. It's, it's sort of like what I think of as like literary citizenship. And um, oh, I love that. That's a yeah. great way to describe it. That's kind of what I think about it as. And I, I think it's also um, a lot of people ask, particularly if they're if they're just starting out, like, how do I build a platform? And I hate the idea of building a platform. It, it makes me feel gross. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm like, what if you swapped out the word platform for readership or community? How do you build a community of writers? And it's never by just being an infomercial for yourself. Right. Um, it's, it's, I always say, if you show up at a party and hang out for a long time and meet a bunch of people, and then eventually you have something like a book that you want to share with them, they're already your friends because you've been at the party for a while and they're like, oh, cool, you wrote a book. Our friend at the party wrote a book. If you show up to the party with a book <laughs> that you're trying to hawk, <laughs> you know, would you like to buy a watch? Would you like to buy a watch? Then you're, you're <laughs> going up to the party for the purpose of selling the party something. And so getting in and and making friends and lifting up other people will honestly serve you later down the road because you're not just showing up at the party with something to sell them all. I agree. And with success comes, in my view, the obligation to carry as we climb. Yes. And I love being able to boost new writers that I like. I mean, I'm not random about it. When it's somebody's work I really like, I want to give it that boost uh, because I know how hard it, I, I will never forget how hard it was in the newsroom and then outside the newsroom and with book publishing, how hard it can be to get a foothold. And if I can do in any way, help somebody else, I feel like that's one of my contributions that I'm required to make because mm -hmm. I, if my success is my only legacy, it dies with me, that, that's it, that's who I am. I did love that one uh, sort of negative review of my children's book said it was too idealistic by half. I told Sherrod, I want that on my two. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Worst case scenario, thinker slash too idealistic. I have. <laughs> That's terrific. We we have uh, we have at least one question from the room on on that uh, the writing process. We do. To. This one comes from our very own Neil. Hi, Connie and Maggie. Yeah, um, you know, I just I just keep thinking about this and looking at the sample pages and looking at children's books all together. And Maggie, you talk about turning in a manuscript and. I think normally like a book manuscript is this bulky thing, but is it smaller with a children's book? And and is that like a shock to your system? Is, you know, obviously in children's books, there's such an economy of words. And did you find yourself, I just have all these 
I just have all these questions about that. Like, do you find yourself pulling yourself back? You know, you wrote, you've overridden my whole sentence, and and it just it, it, did your editors impose word length limits on you, sentence oh, length yeah. limits? Uh, I'm just curious about that whole thing, like how that that works compared to what you normally have written. I did not need um, word limits because uh, I'm a poet. So having to own, having a whole book that fits on a page and a half of a word document is my dream. <laughs> <laughs> I was much more panicked about having to fill um, a memoir. Um, I think when they told me 65,000 word target, I thought, how many sonnets is that? Like, I just don't <laughs> know how. I'm not a long form writer. I'm a short form writer. So um, as a poet, it was, you know, it's like a picture book is is like a haiku. <laughs> it's, it is very spare. You have to do a lot with a, just a little bit of text. And frankly, a lot of the meaning is not even in the text itself. It's communicated through the images. Um, so I felt, I felt honestly really, really comfortable with that. Um, and now have to get back into working on a collection of essays. And I, I wish I could be as spare in those essays as I was in this book. Oh, well, I will I say that there, that's one thing about your memoir. It, it is very interesting and very approachable is sort of this it's short form. I mean, it's short form. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some yeah. of it's uh, some of it's literally tweet length, and uh, yeah. but it's all sparse and just sort of bare bones, and it's very easy to get. And and I think uh, keep moving is the same way. Some of these are um, just uh, yeah. Some are several paragraphs, and some are just a few uh, sentences. So um, it's I, as a reader, it's a very nice way to read you don't feel like i mean i think kind of you're as a as a columnist you're expected to write a certain length and right. maybe sometimes you don't have that much to say and sometimes you have much more to say but you really kind of have to make it fit well as the people who love me would say unfortunately i always have a lot to say it's <laughs> the nature of being a columnist but neil your question i get asked that a lot um when when Casey first met with me, Casey McIntyre, she said, I know you're used to writing novels, but this is shorter. And I said, Casey, I've been writing, I've been filing 700 mm. words a week for 20 years. So <laughs> she told me maximum was a thousand. Maggie, I don't know about your process here. For me, I got one of the uh, the Japanese accordion books and spread them out across the table because first I typed the story on my computer and then I had to uh, figure out art direction, which me meant I had to figure out what goes on what page and it really, and I wrote with pencil, which I almost never do, but I felt I needed to as I kept erasing and drawing arrows. And I would do my own little sketches that no one will ever see those. Um, <laughs> and that should go in your sub stack, I think. Right. That's like a, maybe behind a paywall. That's oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Deep Extra paywall. Benefit. $500. You're going to get to see how I That's spent right. <laughs> but it did give me a sense of the, plus I could gather it up quickly. Like if I was having people for dinner or, you know, doing stuff on the table aside from that. But it made it possible for me to do, uh, they had sent me a block guideline. I, I forget what the name of it is, but it wasn't helpful for me. I needed to see it in a string so I could keep up with where it was. So for me, the challenge, Neil, more than anything, is what goes page by page, because I have a chronology of events. So things are building. And we have those double truck pages where there are crescendos. I don't know if they talked to you about that at all, maybe, but they said, and then you have these moments. I mean, there was what, it was far more formulaic than I knew how they, hmm. they and we're both with big publishers. So th that I did not expect, but it ended up being helpful. It's it, it, because you because you have some built-in parameters you can figure out what's going to fit page by page. And uh, it was definitely a challenge, something I'd never done before. And it was quite rewarding, as it turns out, once I got the discipline of it. I love that Is you it? built it like a, you kind of storyboarded it for <laughs> yourself. I love that. I just worked on a Word document and almost like I was typing up a poem and I imagined the page turns as line breaks. Well, so you, that I can see why you would think that way there. You've had much yeah. more experience with the... The shorter, you know, where I go on for 700, David <laughs> I can tell you, 700, 750 words. I got, you know, I'm at it and I'm ready and I got to end with a strong walk-off every single time. <laughs> this book has a strong walk-off though, Connie. You you still managed to do that here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
but it's making me think of like speech writing. You got to write the short, you know, short, powerful sentences. And then you, when you talk about that formula, Connie, it's making me think of how many of us have written headlines or like summaries in, in different parts of a publication or a website. Sounds like that a lot too. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. I certainly see that analogy. You're right. Why am I so terrible at headlines? Well, I've only written one children's book, so that would explain it. As David knows, <laughs> I'm terrible at headlines. Uh, if anybody has any more questions, we're getting we're getting low on time, but uh, paste them in the chat, and we will get to them. And uh, and I'm curious to know what. Um, actually, let me let me expand on Neil's question a little bit. Um, what 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 was I you, Neil asked? What kind of what was hard about it going to the short form? What was surprising about uh, what what when you did this? What surprised you about how the process went or did it surprise you? Well, for me, collaboration was a huge deal because I've been a solo artist for the most part. I mean, I've done some team reporting when I was a, a beat reporter um, or put on an investigative reporting. But of course, all I wanted really to do was feature writing and then columnist. So I'm used to being I'm used to working on my own. And while writing a novel certainly is collaborative in that, I mean, I. I, if any of you who saw my speech last year, you know how much I believe in the, the gifts of strong editors and I will always need those strong editors. Um, but you're still basically on your own the whole time. When you are working with an illustrator and you're working on a form in a format that you've never done before, you are so much more um, I, I, dependent, isn't it? You're, it's just not your own decision, which I was afraid of at first, a little worried about. It ended up being the most liberating part of it because there is so much talent that comes into it that I don't possess um, that made it better. And certainly number one, exhibit A, of course, uh, is Sandy Rodriguez and how just beautifully she illustrated this and how she got it, how she understood what I was trying to do. Maggie, I, it sounded like you had a similar experience where it just takes your breath away when you see what, the, what she's coming up with. And I, how could she possibly have known this is what I meant? when I didn't think I had even been articulate enough about it, but she was, she is that illustrator. And I mean, I've always loved artists just as I love photography and photographers. I've worked for a lot of photographers over the years and it has really renewed my sense of um, the need for creativity and how much it's, how important it is to encourage it in young people in particular. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah, how about so you, Maggie, any yeah, the Ill, I mean, the illustrations, I think, were the most surprising because it's, you know, handing someone text. I've, I've had, you know, surprising cover designs before. Yes. That's as close as I've ever come is when someone right. comes to me with a cover design that I just love or don't love. You know, I've had both experiences. Um, and, and yet this felt completely different because so much of the meaning making was dependent and the tone um, was dependent on someone else's work in this in this book. And so I kind of showed up with my half and it was like a relay race and just sort of handed the baton to her. And then she just completely ran with it and then handed me back more or less this fully formed creature <laughs> mm -hmm. that, I, that I now get to be one of the parents of. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like co-parenting in a way, I suppose. <laughs> Um, and, and so that was really the most, the most surprising thing and, and working with, I mean, I worked with my editor, Donna Bray, she gave great suggestions. Um, and I also, before I even sent the book out, um, to try to publish it, I sent it to a, a writer friend of mine, Allison McGee, who wrote for both, she writes for both children and adults. And I just said, Hey, would you like peek at this and just, I don't need notes, but just tell me like, am I on the right track? Is this like worth pursuing? Am I? And she came back with the most generous notes for me that really the, the, the biggest takeaway, and I will always think about this as I continue to write for children was the agency has to be with a child. The, the adult in the book can be a guide, can be a companion, can be a help, but the adult cannot solve the child's problem. Yes. 
Yep. The agency has to be with the child because the child who's reading this book wants to see themselves and wants to have agency and wants to feel empowered and doesn't want the grown up swooping in and being the superhero. No kid wants to read a book where the parent is the superhero. And so I did sort of like adjust some of the conversation between the parent and the child to make sure the parent wasn't overstepping and suggesting mm -hmm. too much that the child was doing the imagining and was really taking that on themselves. And it was just exactly the advice I needed at the time. That was similar to how I looked at it with the trusted adult. And I didn't want it to be the parents because unfortunately not all children by a long shot feel that their trusted adult is a parent. So mm -hmm. I want it, and, it was, and the reason I'm so glad I did this is all the conversations I'm having with children and, then, and, and who their trusted adult would be overwhelmingly, it's a teacher, which is really striking to me. What we ask the, of our teachers so much. I, 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 so I, I have to say the trusted adult here. Now, was this inspired by Connie Schultz? That does uh, not look like me at all. <laughs> um, okay. I keep, I keep being asked that. No, what? I'm not in it. I was thinking of the hair Dr. color Bird on, on Golden Pond. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I thought we were going to go with that, and she came up with her own thing, which is great. And Mitch, has nothing to do with the Senate. I keep being asked if I made the troll's name Mitch on purpose, his real name. No. Oh, gosh, I never thought. Nothing to do with that. <laughs> I would never let that man near my children's book. <laughs> <laughs> never thought of that. Things you have right, to what... explain. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're almost out of time. I do. I, I wanted to ask, though, so what's uh, what what's coming up? Uh, Connie, you said you are interested in doing a uh, children's book. And Maggie, I think you just said, as I continue to write for children. So we're going to see more uh, of this this form. Yes, but if my agent's watching this, I, I need to make sure. Yes, I'm working on the novel. OK, good. <laughs> What's the novel? Can you tell us anything about the novel? Or the, the previous one was Daughters of Eerie Town. Um, right, it's not a sequel. But I will say, Miss Sneesby, by the way, Sneesby is a real name. People keep asking me, but it's named for a really? man named who's 67 and thrilled to be in this book with my name only. <laughs> uh, Miss Sneesby, actually, the novel I'm working on is a bookstore owner named Miss Sneesby. I was brainstorming with my daughter a name for the person in the book. Who's going to be the trusted adult? And she said, Mom, you already got Miss Sneesby. Why don't you make her the character? So there's a crossover here, but it's about a grandmother whose uh, granddaughter in her early 20s has come to stay with her because life's kind of out of sorts. And uh, it, that's all I'll do for now because I don't want to take much time. I want Maggie to talk about what she's working on next. Yes, Maggie, what are you working on? What am I, um, who, is my agent also watching? And, and therefore, what is the correct answer? <laughs> I'm always writing poems. Um, I'm, I'm working toward another book of poems. I'm working on an essay collection that will be out next year. Um, and I'm gearing up for the paperback of the memoir to come out in June. So I'll be back on the road um, for, for the paperback of the memoir. And what's what's coming up? You you haven't done any promotion for this yet. It just came out. No, Tuesday. not a thing. Not a thing. Um, I uh, it's a holiday weekend coming up, and I'll be out of town mm -hmm. with any luck. So um, ne next the twenty fifth of February, I'll be at the Bexley Public Library, and that's that's the sort the of like launch. local. Yeah, the local the local launch. But I'm not I'm not hitting the road for this one. They don't oh, okay. do that with children's books as much. Yeah, they don't really, and and I'm not angry hmm. about it. I, I've uh, spent a lot of this year on the road, um, a lot of the last year on the road, and I'll be back doing it again. And so I'm honestly just delighted to get to be home with the muses of this book. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all over Ohio, and and I hope I think we're going to try to limit it to that for now. Uh, I'll do. I am going to be my granddaughter's secret reader in Rhode Island in March. Um, oh, sweet. And, Yes, I mean, some things you must say yes to. I love that. Right. All right. Well, it's been delightful. Uh, our hour is up, but it's been uh, wonderful learning about the process and the books. I, the books I love. The books are, you know, I mean, I, I think that's one key is if you, can, if you can pick up a picture book and read it and get to the end and say, wow, that, that's nice. I, that inspired me as an adult. There's some there's a good message there. Um, both those accomplish that Lola and the troll and my thoughts have wings. Uh, pick them both up. They're wonderful books. We will be back uh, in a few weeks. Our next show, I can't remember the date, but we have uh, Colleen Newvine, uh, who's the project manager for AP Stylebook, and she has a book on 
she has a book on um, on uh, what is it Sabbat mini sabbaticals is how she terms it is sort of taking a break, getting away, um, and finding yourself in a in a preferably in somewhere warm and sunny. Uh, so we're looking forward to that. And uh, thank you so much. We will see you in a few weeks. Oh, it's March 5th. March 5th. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much.